thanks for joining us. President Biden will travel the country this week, making the case for social and climate programs in his Build Back Better agenda. He's trying to unify progressive and moderate Democrats around a price tag for the plan before the House can proceed with a vote on a companion bill to address infrastructure. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer on Monday called on his party to reach an agreement within a matter of days. It'll require sacrifice, compromise, and finding common ground. Nobody is going to get everything they want. Meanwhile, the clock is ticking for Congress to raise the debt ceiling. The Treasury Department says lawmakers have until October 18th to extend the government's ability to borrow money and pay the spending Congress already authorized. If not, the U.S. could fully default on its debts for the first time in history. Republicans plan to continue to filibuster the vote to raise the debt ceiling. They say Democrats should use a special Senate process to raise it themselves. In a speech this morning, President Biden criticized the GOP, accusing them of playing Russian roulette with the economy. He warned about the consequences if Congress fails to act in time. They won't raise it even though defaulting on the debt would lead to a self-inflicted wound that takes our economy over a cliff and risks jobs and retirement savings, Social Security benefits, salaries for service members, benefits for veterans, and so much more. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell accused Democrats of risking the state of the economy for the sake of procedural convenience. Democrats could not be more capable of handling this on their own. Just months ago, the Democratic leader won new powers to reuse reconciliation over and over. They don't even need our consent to set a vote at 51 instead of 60. They need even less help raising the debt limit than majorities needed in the past. So trust me, Madam President, if Republicans were sitting on a hidden veto power to stop reconciliation bills, you would have heard about it way back in the springtime. For more, let's bring in Nancy Cordes, Zeke Miller, and Mariana Sotomayor. Nancy is CBS News Chief White House Correspondent. Zeke is a CBSN political contributor and White House reporter for the Associated Press. And Mariana is a congressional reporter for The Washington Post. Welcome and happy Monday to all of you. A lot to talk about today. Zeke, let me start with you. President Biden blasted Republicans during today's remarks on the debt ceiling. What exactly is he accusing them of? Well, he's accusing them essentially of hypocrisy, of, uh, of, of voting, uh, of not uh, voting to allow the U.S. government to meet its obligations for spending. That was a, a good chunk of it was incurred under the last administration, President Donald Trump's administration, and passed by Republican uh, majorities in, in Congress back then. Uh, this is an effort by the president, really, to uh, you know, if, Demo if Republicans want to make Democrats raise the debt limit alone, uh, the president and the Democrats are going to sort of try to maximize this political moment as well and attack Republicans for uh, obstructionism, playing games with uh, the full faith and credit of the United States. This is a, a partisan fight that ultimately will get resolved because uh, you know, the, the stakes of, uh, of a U.S. government default are just too high for both parties to, uh, to, to, to really comprehend. Uh, but in, you know, in, in the near term, you know, next two weeks, while this figures out how exactly it gets resolved is a big open question. But it's going to get resolved, but it's going to be messy for both sides, and both parties are trying to sort of get their political licks in. All right. Well, Nancy, last week, the president stayed in Washington to negotiate directly with moderates on his Build Back Better plan. You asked White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki about this earlier. Let's listen to that. How long do you plan to give those negotiations with Manchin and Cinema? Is there a deadline? Well, I would say that our objective is getting this done and delivering for the American people, and uh, we're going to continue pressing forward until we get it done. Uh, so, yes, it requires uh, Senator Sinema and Senator Manchin uh, moving forward and supporting a path forward. It also requires uh, agreement on what uh, a package would look like. So the president's going to continue to work with a range of members from across the Democratic caucus. So now the president is hitting the road to sell his agenda to the public. What is the White House saying, Nancy, about the price tag for his social spending plan? And historically, have these roadshows been effective for him? Well, Elaine, what the White House is saying today is notable, essentially conceding for the first time that his signature 
piece of legislation is going to be a lot smaller than he had initially hoped. Uh, the press secretary, Jen Psaki, saying that he is holding a virtual call with progressives this afternoon. In fact, I just spoke to a member who's still on that call, basically asking those progressives what they're willing to give up in order for him to be able to strike a deal with Senators Manchin and Cinema. Uh, this comes after yet another weekend where we saw no breakthroughs in the negotiations. And as we know, Manchin in particular is holding firm to this $1.5 trillion price tag. That's more than, uh, that's slashing this bill by more than half because the president's plan is $3.5 trillion dollars. This is no doubt going to be a cause of great frustration to progressives who say they're almost there. They're almost across the finish line. They just need these two more votes. But, you know, whether they need two votes or 20 votes, the result is the same. They are going to have to negotiate and they're going to have to start figuring out which of those priorities that are stuffed into the Build Back Better bill they can live without. So, Mariana, you have been reporting about a growing trust deficit for Democrats. This is what you wrote. Uh, the party's, quote, ability to rebuild unity and get their two-pronged legislative strategy back on track will be paramount to whether they close out the year having delivered on the promises they made to voters ahead of what is expected to be a difficult midterm election. Is it clear what parts of this big social spending bill could be cut? So that's something that members are very much trying to figure out now. Actually, it was uh, like minutes after Biden left Capitol Hill on Friday that members of the Progressive Caucus decided to meet to just start having those conversations of what they're willing to live without. You've also seen other members, including moderates and frontliners, those who are most vulnerable and represent some of the most vulnerable districts. They're already telegraphing whether it is in op-eds or statements about what they want to see for, for, for those models, as well as I would say some progressives, they definitely want to make sure that they can lower the cost of prescription drugs. That has been a point of contention for other moderates as well. And then you also have heard from many members about how to divvy up uh, health care pricing. There's some priorities like expanding Medicare. There's also others like making sure that Medicaid is is present in, in Republican states who have decided over the years to not implement a number of Affordable Care Act uh, subsidies, making some of those permanent as well. So those are some of the debates happening right now. But really, going back to your initial question, there is this problem of trust. Put aside everything that has to do with the policies and how much should be funded here and there, really what leaders have to do is try and mend a lot of these trust issues between progressives, between submoderates that really did boil over in statements over the weekend, whether it was from a, a really key vote like Senator Kirsten Cinema, who said that good faith negotiations can only be had if there are if there is a foundation of trust, suggesting that the president going against um, the bipartisan, well, not against the bipartisan infrastructure bill, but that vote that was supposed to happen that week, many moderates say who were really pushing that, that it's, it's just not fair to them that they're not able to, to show support for that. And, it, and they are also blaming the progressives for being part of that problem. I'm going to ask you more about that in just a moment, Mariana. But Zeke, meantime, the White House continues to field questions about inflation and continues to say it's just temporary. Is the administration taking any action to tackle the rising price of consumer goods and fuel? Uh, certainly when it comes to fuel, uh, that uh, I think all of us who, who drive have seen uh, the steady increase at, at the pump. The White House has, sort of, has said that some of this is uh, short term, uh, just a function of supply, uh, as you know, uh, because of of, of, of uh, tropical weather uh, at the Gulf, Gulf of Mexico disrupting uh, refineries, uh, other global pressures. But we've also seen sort of a broader look. The White House encouraging uh, the FTC to study whether there is uh, any sort of collusion or market manipulation among uh, gas station providers. The White House is taking that one fairly seriously. When it comes to broader consumer goods. They've been fairly consistent. Sort of their talking point is that this is just a, a momentary, transient uh, inflation as a result of sort of the economy struggling to get back online um, after a year and a half of pandemic disruption. Um, that very well may be true. 
to a certain extent. Uh, but uh, that's not going to be a huge reassurance to people who have to sort of shell out more right now whose paychecks don't go as uh, as far, particularly heading into the holiday season when there, you know, there are all sorts of supply chain disruptions uh, that are going to make you know gifts for loved ones and, and the like uh, more expensive. So it's a, the White House is in a bit of a tough uh, political spot. Even They may be right on the economics, but they have a political problem on their hands as some of these prices rise. Right. Americans very much noticing the prices of these goods and fuel going up. Um, Mariana, so President Biden did appear to side with progressives last week when he said that these two bills would remain linked. Um, what does that say about which part of the Democratic Party here is really in control and sort of steering the ship, so to speak? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Last week was really the culmination of a debate about when to hold a vote. It was very much based on process, more so than policy prescriptions. So that in and of itself is interesting just because it, it just had to do with a certain date and when you vote on this. However, it's worth pointing out that Biden, as much as he did campaign as, as a uniter, someone who was able to not just reach out to Democrats, but also Republicans, something worth remembering is that on the campaign trail, he would get very frustrated if he was called by anyone a moderate. He really wanted to prove that he was a, a progressive, someone who did em embody and, and want to push the limits on different policies, make sure and, and made promises to communities of color, to the to, to the less fortunate that they that he could be the kind of president to also bridge a number of disparities that they have faced over time. So all to say that really Biden, as much as he sided with the progressive point of view that both of these bills need to pass together in tandem at some point in time, really what he has been pushing for and, and why he made that, uh, that agreement basically is because he wants to make sure the entirety of his agenda is implemented, not just the infrastructure part that is going to deliver a number of jobs to also key constituencies that did put him over the edge and elect him president in, in certain swing districts and, and states, I should say, but also that more social, economic, um, education, climate, really big priorities for the party to kind of set it in a new direction. All right. Well, Nancy, let's switch gears and talk about foreign policy. Today, the Biden administration announced it will continue to impose tariffs against China that were initially put in place under former President Trump. Now, U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai will speak with her Chinese counterparts this week. What are those talks expected to focus on? Well, you know, the U.S. trade rep in a speech today answered a question that a lot of people had, which was, will the Biden administration's approach to trade with China differ dramatically from the Trump administration's approach? And the answer, at least for right now, appears to be no. She said that the U.S. is going to maintain, for the most part, the tariffs that were imposed by the Trump administration. They're not going to impose any new tariffs right now. They're also not going to punish China for what she said were violations by that country of a trade agreement that had already been uh, made between the U.S. and China, though she did say that she wants to be able to sit down and talk with her Chinese counterpart to discuss these violations and how they can move forward. But the bottom line is that the tariffs that were already put in place by the Trump administration are going to stay for now. All right, Mariana, The Washington Post reports that Donald Trump's advisors have convinced him to hold off on announcing a 2024 re-election bid. What is the former president planning in the coming months? Yeah, you know, a number of my colleagues reporting that uh, today. And really, you have seen, at least for the most part, Trump has been holding rallies so far, trying to endorse other members of Congress to try and primary people who did impeach him. We should likely expect to see that. And not to mention that even at these rallies, he's hinted that he's you know, going to make a decision soon. He's going to announce that he you know, has some plans. He tries to keep that mystery alive. But you know, it, it is worth, um, it, it's at least interesting that there is, there, there's more people at least pointing out that he could jump in later, sooner rather than later. But TBD, that's still something that we um, still need to see. 
Yeah, the very much um, big open question um, for Republicans especially who are looking at 2024 as well. All right, Nancy Cordes, Zeke Miller, and Mariana Sotomayor, thank you all very much.